Church, and also welcome to 2021. You guys excited about that? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's something to celebrate. And I don't know about you, but man, worship this morning was just incredible. What a, what a great way to start off our year by just entering the presence of God. It's a great way to start our day. It's a great way to have a middle of our day. It's a great way to end our day. It is a great way just to be together with God, celebrating a truly amazing and wonderful creator. So we are beginning a week of a fast, and you may be hearing that for the very first time this morning, and you ate breakfast. Guess what? It's okay. Um, you can just pick up later in the afternoon or pick up tomorrow, but it's really important for us to fast and to pray and to seek God's face. Fasting is a great way for us just to humble ourselves in the things that we really need in order for us to set aside time for God to speak to us and to do and to give us what we truly need in our own lives. And so this year, Let's start off by just fasting and praying and seeking God's face. Well, today we are beginning a brand new series called, Is God Good? Now, I'm pretty sure at some point in your life, you've all heard or maybe even said this phrase, and if you wanna say it, you can go ahead and say it with me. It says, God is good, and then it's repeated with, oh, there, oh you guys have heard this before, all the time, and then someone usually says, all the time, and then someone says, God is good, right? Yeah, you guys have said that a couple few times maybe in your lifetime, yeah. Well, the question of God's goodness is one that has been asked, well, I'm pretty sure since the very beginning of time. We don't have all of the conversations between Adam and God, but I'm inclined to believe that Adam was no different than you or, or I. I'm almost positive that after being kicked out of the garden, Adam maybe had his fair share of a few mantrams. Um, I'm sure that he was frustrated. I'm sure that he, he complained just maybe a little, you know, to go from paradise, to go from having everything, to going to having to have nothing. Um, I think you would complain just a tad bit. Really, God? You're going to punish me for what she did? I bet he said it. Really, God? That wasn't, it wasn't my fault. That'd be the, how many would that be your go-to? Not my fault. I didn't do it, right? That's, I'm sure he went there. God, how in the world is this really fair? God, you say you really love us and you've got a strange way of showing us you love us right now. God, this life is just hard. The question, is God good, is still being asked today. We are never going to escape it. No matter where we go, what we watch, what we listen to, what we choose to read, we're gonna be faced with this experience of a difficult life. The degrees of difficulty are gonna vary from person to person, but nonetheless, there are difficulties. We face the question of God's goodness even more when our difficult experiences leave us craving for an explanation of why is this even happening in the first place. So if you're like me, your mind begins to run a marathon around a three-letter question. Why? You start rethinking every possible experience that's led you up to this exact moment that you're now faced with and after exhausting yourself because you decided to run this marathon in your mind, you are faced with still not having an answer to why it's even happening in the first place. And then if you're stubborn like me, guess what? You decide to run it again and ask yourself why and you go back through this whole piece, this process in your mind again and then you lay down in bed, just close your eyes and be like, wow, what happened for the rest of my day? because you're just exhausted yourself and maybe it might have been just best for you just to accept that what's going on around you and you can't you can't change that so I was driving not too long ago in the car with my kids and I heard this hey dad and I did what most parents do when hearing this exact phrase you stay silent and you keep driving <laughs> why well, it wasn't because I wanted to ignore them or because I didn't care but because I knew that this hey dad was going to be followed up with the next phrase, guess what? Now, kids vastly overestimate how much adults like to guess things, okay? <laughs> they do. Because, because I didn't respond right away, I got the, hey, dad. I got it again. Hey, dad. Man, they're persistent. So I responded with, yeah, what's going on? What's up? The next few words shocked me because what I was expecting to hear was this. 
hey, my sister is silently mocking me. Can you make her stop? Or I was expecting to hear, can we go get Chick-fil-A? And my response was going to be, no, it's Sunday. They're closed. You ask us every Sunday, and you know this. For the last 10 years of your life, you've asked, can we go to Chick-fil-A? It's never going to be open. Stop asking. Or they're going to, hey, can we go to Target? Because I want to buy something with your money that ultimately I'm going to break in five seconds, and I'm going to be mad that I broke it, right? This is what I'm expecting to hear them say. But that's not what came out. So she sat there. So I've been thinking a lot, okay? Is God really good? She said, COVID messed up my life, messed up my school. It took away my friends. I can't understand why people are fighting with one another because they're different colors. I don't understand why things are so hard. Dad, is God good? Because if he was good, why is my life so hard right now? In that moment, I could only squeak out, yes, and I just kept driving. That was the answer I gave. Parent of the year, right? She's begging me, what's the question? I need to know this answer. And all I said was, yes. And just kept driving my car. Because how could I explain to a nine-year-old that in every season of her life, in every place of her existence, there's going to be this tension and there's going to be this conflict from the heart-wrenching reality of losing loved ones and facing the reality of this unknown future to the simple inconvenience that her iced white chocolate mocha with whipped sweet cream and extra caramel drizzle is going to become warm. I mean, this is the reality that she's faced with. Is God really good? And if he is, why is he allowing me to go through these things? And when we're faced with life's tough questions, there's only one place for us to go. We got to get into the word. So let's go there. King David details the goodness of God in Psalm 145. And this is a monumental praise summary of all of David has learned about God during his life of highs and lows. And it's the last psalm that we have recorded that King David actually wrote. And I want to read that. It says, I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. They speak of the glorious splendor of your majesty, and I will meditate on your wonderful works. They tell the power of your awesome works, and I will proclaim your great deeds. They celebrate your abundant goodness and joyful singing of your righteousness. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. All your works praise you, Lord. Your faithful people extol you. They tell of the glory of your kingdom and speak of your might so that all people may know of your mighty acts and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures through all generations. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. He fulfills the desires of those who fear him and hears their cry and saves them. The Lord watches over all who love him, but all the wicked he will destroy. My mouth will speak in praise of the Lord. Let every creature praise his holy name forever and ever. This psalm is full of the imagery of God's goodness. And it's a lot. And I know we just flew through that pretty quickly. So what I want you guys to challenge you this week, read this psalm as we fast and we pray and really hear David's heart and learn from his example of how he had fully given his life over to God. In another psalm, Psalm 1830, we're reminded that as for God, his way is perfect. See, God makes no mistakes. He has no oversights. And just because you and I can't see in the midst of every circumstance doesn't mean that God isn't good. So how do we know that God is good? We know that God is good because he allows us to choose. God gave us this freedom to walk our own path. We're not mindless robots. 
He gave us a choice to surrender our will for his. Why? Because he wanted this relationship with us. He doesn't want us to be a, a dictatorship over our lives and just make us do what he wants us to do. He wants us to freely have a relationship with him. We see this all the way back in Genesis as Adam and Eve were left with their own choices, which led to sin, which brought with it pain and suffering. Gone was their endless honeymoon in paradise. See, our choices, whether they're good or they're bad, not only affect us, but they have an effect on other people who are a part of our lives. And God is not the one to blame for these things. See, because God is our refuge, He's our strength and an ever-present help when we're in trouble. And we, like God, we get to make our own choices. Unlike the rest of the physical creation, we're not a creature of instinct, reacting only to the present patterns of our lives. We analyze things, and then we make a choice. We have been given this incredible mind and this incredible freedom of choice. And here's the thing, God respects our choices. He expects our ability to choose and we have a responsibility to help others choose wisely. As a parent, my responsibility for my children's upbringing lies on me. However, as they grow older, I need to find this healthy balance between uh, their ability to choose and their responsibility in their upbringing. And to show my children that I care and that I'm good, I don't dominate them or I don't provoke them. Instead, it's my responsibility to be an example of Jesus to them and to help them understand things clearly instead of burdening them with a lot of rules. I give them this freedom to choose within guidelines as they're younger and loosen those as they become older, hoping and praying that they continue to make the wise choices that were laid as a foundation for them. And that's what God does for us. You know what? God is also good because he found a way to rescue us. God is not unaware of our personal struggles. It's because of his awareness that he found a way to rescue us through the life of his son, Jesus. God is good because he paid for the wrongs that we should be paying for. And Jesus let us know in John 15, 13, that greater love has no one than this, to lay down one's own life for one's own friends. And I've read that verse many times. And what stood out for the first time was that Jesus was foreshadowing his death to his disciples. And he was telling them what he was about to do for not only them, but for the world. What's also important that we read that is that Jesus calls us this. He calls us friends. A friend is not a stranger. God is no stranger to us. Sure, there are times when we're not good friends, And there's other times where we're great friends, but nonetheless, we're friends. And God is saying, I want to be a friend with you and I am going to rescue you and lay down my life for you. God is good because he is patient and forgiving. All throughout scripture, we have this picture of a God who longs and is waiting for us to come to repentance. He's not hiding himself but is extending his hand out to everyone. He is a patient because it's in our nature to question God's goodness. Think of all the times that you may have questioned his goodness and yet God is, sits there and he's just patient with you. Job did. However, when we question God's goodness, we offend his holiness. God has the ability and the right to wipe mankind off the face of the earth but he doesn't because Psalm 103, eight says the Lord is compassionate and he's gracious and he's slow to anger, abounding in love. He will patiently wait to forgive and redeem and give a new start to anyone who asks. And because of this patience, we don't receive what we ultimately deserve. And we may want a smooth road in life, but we're not promised a smooth road in life. We are promised that God will be with us, that he will protect us, that he will give us strength, that he will answer us, and he will provide for us. He will always love us. That's what we're promised. 
Not that life is going to be easy and we're never going to get a red light and we're never going to have to stop and we're going to get to drive 70 miles an hour, never hit a traffic jam. He's not promised that in life. He's promised strength, protection, that he's there for us. And God keeps his word and he patiently waits. See, God is good because he makes the use of the failures of our past. He redeems any person reverses any mistakes, and makes a masterpiece out of any mess. Paul helps us understand how God works in our lives in Romans chapter 8, and he explains to us that there's this life for us through God's Holy Spirit, that the mind that is governed by, by flesh is death, but the mind governed by a spirit is of life and peace. He begins ending this part of his letter by, by talking about the present sufferings and our future glory. That in all things, and he's not saying that there's some things, but he's saying that in all things, God works out the good of those who love him. We are not the failures of our past. Are they a part of us? Absolutely. But they do not give us our identity. We are not defined by our circumstances. We are defined by this creator who made us in his image and we're defined as sons and daughters of a king. And when we allow the failures of our life to consume us, we are ignoring the fact that we're created in the image of the one who truly loves us, who has never failed us. We forget that part when we just say, oh, well, my life is this and how could I ever be used to do something great for God? Our failures remind us that God is there to pick up the pieces and put them back together. There is a, a Japanese art form called kintsugi. And it's when you take a broken piece of pottery and you mend those pieces back to its original place by using gold, silver, or platinum. It treats the breakage or repair as part of the history of that object rather than something to disguise. See, God takes our broken pieces mends them with his goodness to showcase and transform other people's lives and by showing what he's done through us. See, he doesn't just give up on us when we end up broken. He doesn't say, well, that pottery broke, throw it away. No, he picks it up, brings it all back together, mends us with not only just parts, but he mends us with his best parts. Amen. Is God good? You know, my simple answer to my nine-year-old daughter was, yes. That little yes in the car was the, uh, the correct answer. It was. Did it need a little more explanation? Sure it did. Was it the right time to be driving down the road to try to explain this to someone who might not totally understand it at the time? Probably not. So that, yes, it sufficed her at the time. She's like, oh, okay. And she just went on with her, went on with her work and, and didn't, you know, ask me that question again. But I had to ask myself in that moment, could I have actually given her an explanation in that moment? I needed to remind myself of God's goodness. It's a reminder that we all need. Without this reminder, we're going to have a hard time doing what David did in the psalm that we read earlier, reminding ourselves how that we can tell the generations of God's goodness and mighty acts. There are days in life that there's no easy way to put this, and there's no way to sugarcoat this word. There's just days in life that just suck, right? Yeah. There's no way. There's, you wake up, and it's like, man, this is just, this is just a horrible day already. You just wake up feeling that way. But there is a huge but in this. Because there's hope. There's hope. There's hope in a God who loves us, cares for us, and is giving us his best. And when you wake up in those days and you're walking through having these moments where you're just like, man, just, just, what is good going on right now? I want you to stop. 
just find something in that moment that's just beautiful. To flip your mind from the negative to something that is great going on. For you, that thing that might be beautiful is just looking at God's creation or watching the river flow as it goes through the rip down past downtown. It might be something even really simple as just a mess of toys that was left in your house or clothes that didn't get picked up to remind you that, hey, there's little ones in my home right now and they make me smile. For all of us, whatever that is that's beautiful is gonna be different. But there is something. And when we start to focus on those things, it's amazing how we, we bring ourselves out of this, oh, is God good? Is he he's even here? Does he even listen to me? To say, all right, God, thank you for showing me who you are right now in this moment. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 10 tells us that we are hard pressed on every side, but not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. We're persecuted, but not abandoned. We're struck down, but we are not destroyed. And something amazing happens when we can come face to face with our hardships and come out on the other side. We can come out bitter, we can come out angry, we can come out hating the world, or we can come with a hope of a future that we don't yet understand. And when we come out with this hope, because we're not destroyed. I go back to my daughter asking, is God good? And today, I would tell her, yeah, God never promised us an easy road, but he promised to protect us. He promised to give you strength, to answer us, to provide and to give us peace. And God keeps his word, and that makes him good. That's what makes him good. So ask yourself, is God good? And then let your mind take you to the places that you may have forgotten. Let me pray today. God, today, would you remind us all of the good you have done in our life? God, you, would you prepare us for this unknown future? Because I'm sure there's a lot of people sitting here in this room and at home that don't like the unknown. That we, we want things to be to planned out and we, we have this certain picture of what we want it to look like, but God, you show up and <laughs> you've got your plan for our life and we don't have answers to that. So prepare us, God, for the unknown. God, would you take our failures and make use of them? God, we, we thank you for you being patient and forgiving. And God, there may be here somebody today just sitting there like, wow, I've had failures, but God can use them. And I want you to know he can. Would you just draw your hearts toward a God who is good? And God, today, would you just bring us into a closer relationship with you to remind us that, that we do have a friend who cares about what's going on in our life. We have a Savior who loves us and wants to take those pieces and showcase to the world what he has done through us. God, you truly are great. And we thank you for what you're going to do in this new year through us. God, let us be a, a showcase of your goodness to a world that needs to know that you're good. God, you are amazing. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen.